how you guys doing? Mr. H back from a well-deserved vacation. I don't know about well-deserved, but I went on vacation for a while. Welcome to Planet Earth. We're back. Hope you had a great week. Uh, if you didn't, hey, maybe this is what gets you off to a great start, huh? Off we go. Let's talk about some real blood and gore. All right, let's talk about the Roman Empire. No, not that guy. No, Monty Python. Yeah, that's the Roman Empire, but I'll be honest with you, that's, that's, that's not far back enough. Let's go back to the Roman Republic. There we are. That's what a Roman soldier in the 2nd century B.C. looked like. 3rd century B.C. Let's go with that. Is, um, you know, you, you can tell they're definitely Roman. The shield's a little different. The helmet's a little bit different. But no doubt about it, these guys are from Rome. And why are we talking about the Roman Republic today? Well, we're going to talk about the Punic War. What's the Punic War all about? It's about Rome going up against Carthage. This is one of the bloodiest, nastiest, and most vicious wars of the ancient world. And most ancient wars are bloody, nasty, and vicious because, you know, aside from archers and slingers, it's up close and personal. We got shields, we got spears, you know, we got everything. It, it, it can get really nasty. Now, what, what, what's so important about the First Punic War? Notice it's at first, you know, some more coming, right? Well, Rome, everyone's under this impression that the Romans woke up one day and decided to conquer the whole world. It didn't really work out that way. Rome got into the world empire business kind of by accident. If you're an ancient alien, you know, flying over Rome, say 400 BC, you say, eh, seem to have their stuff together, pretty well organized, look like good fighters. They'll dominate all of Italy one day. I can see that happening. And lo and behold, here they are in 264 BC. They are dominating Italy. Problem is, we got Carthage across the way. And these are two large empires. And they're probably going to run into each other one day. Rome is going to run into them by accident. See Syracuse right there? Syracuse is a Greek city-state. You heard me right, Greek. You think of Greece, Athens, and Sparta, way over there to the east, fighting out with Persia. These are the other Greeks, the Western Greeks in Syracuse. They're fighting with uh, Carthage for control of Sicily. It goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth over there. And it looks like Carthage here is about to win. Syracuse has this mercenary group to hire out called the Sons of Mars, kind of like, you know, Wagner Group in Russia today, that kind of thing. And like every other mercenary group, they lose complete control of it. And the Sons of Mars up there in Messina have taken over for themselves, fighting Syracusans and Carthaginians. So they are seeming to talk to the Carthaginians, trying to make a deal with them. So Syracuse calls in Rome. So here comes Rome. Rome is getting mixed up into this. They're getting pulled into the battle here for Sicily. The First Punic War, as you can see, is going to be a large war a vicious war a nasty war when you think of large vicious and nasty yeah pittsburgh steelers baltimore ravens first thing comes to mind here early 21st century <laughs> don't worry we'll talk about those guys a little bit later on problem with rome facing off at carthage is well just like sparta and athens in the peloponnesian war rome is a land power carthage is a sea power so you don't have to go very far into sicily to win but you know, you still need a navy if you're going to defeat Carthage. Carthage has a pretty good army, but going up against the Romans might not work out. You're going to end up with a stalemate here. So somehow, some way, just like the Spartans, Rome has to come up with a navy. So they actually found a Carthaginian ship. They reverse engineered it, but they're not very good sailors. They don't have the experience the Carthaginians do. So just like Sparta, they got to think of a way to win in an environment they're not familiar with. And here we go. We got the Corvus. You're going to learn some Latin today. Corvus means raven. See that spike over there, a little bridge they have? What they do is that they drop that bridge. The spike digs into a Carthaginian trireme. Remember triremes, right? And then all the legionaries are going to run across and take over the Carthaginian ship. You remember from our discussion of the Peloponnesian War, you don't try to sink an enemy trireme. You try to capture it because that way... You know, you just got to fill in the hole there from the Corvus, and boom, you got yourself a free ship. And uh, probably a better made ship, to be honest with you, if it's Carthaginian. I always wondered how much armor the legionaries had on the ship. Probably not a lot, man. You just run across with your shield, you know. <laughs> if you fall in that water, forget it, man. It's not a lake. This is the Mediterranean. So they use the Corvus right here, the Raven. Yep, make your Baltimore Raven jokes already. 
and this is how they're going to fight against the Carthaginians, and it turns out they're actually quite successful. Now, they, they defeat the Carthaginians actually on sea a few times. It's shocking. They, they pull it off. However, this war is going to be decided in Sicily. And have any of you ever been to Sicily? It's rocky. It's hilly. It's hot. If you haven't been to Sicily, go to Arizona. Almost the same thing, right? The Carth I mean, the Romans are very good at siege warfare. No one doubts this. They are probably the best in the ancient world. Got the ballistas there. We got catapults. Um, okay, siege towers, right? These guys are very hard to beat. But a siege in the ancient world is not easy. Just not only for the people in the siege, but sometimes worse for the besieger. Because if the people in the city know what's coming, they've got time to build up supplies. And, you know, the guys outside don't have those kind of supplies. They may end up starving to death out there and end up leaving. But, you know, these are Romans. They've thought this out pretty well in advance. And they're just going to going to keep fighting city after city after city. It's a long war. It's a tough war. 24 years. But the Romans finally win this thing. Oh, and they are going to get their pound of flesh from the Carthaginians. They take Sicily. Yeah, that's ours now, man. We earned it. They take Corsica. They take Sardinia. They throw this huge reparations bill on the Carthaginians. They even limit their navy. They're going to make sure Carthage doesn't rise up to attack them again. Hey, does this sound familiar? Yeah, remember the end of the First World War? They hit Germany with that big, that big uh, reparations bill and took a lot of territory. What happened? Right? They came back 20 years later. That's why they called it back then in 1918, 1919 rather, a Carthaginian peace. This is where they get the, uh, this is where they get that saying from. As you can see, Carthage is still, still pretty good size over here. Rome won the war, but they couldn't invade Carthage. They took their navy away from them. They said you couldn't uh, have to trade with Roman permission. So, that, you know, they can't really do anything. But you see, they do own Spain. And one day, somebody over there, well, we don't know who his name is, but some Carthaginian enterprising guy, digging around in the hills, and guess what they found over there? Oh, yeah, it wasn't gold. It's the next best thing. Oh, yeah, they found silver. Oh, lots of silver. And, you know, they got a lot of money floating around, and all of a sudden, hey, I can start only to build my army back up. No one's saying about an army. I start hiring out these Spanish tribesmen. Later on, people from Gaul are going to show up. We've even got Numidians showing up and people from Africa. They're going to build themselves a huge army. They redefine themselves from a naval power to a land power. And you don't build an army that big just to do it. You know they've got something in mind. What do you think that is, huh? Well, you know it was the first Punic War. So what happens after the first? You're going to have a second. There we are, round two. 218 B.C. to 202 B.C. Yep, this is the one with the elephants. Hannibal and the elephants crossing the Alps over here. I don't quite think it was that dramatic, to be honest with you. Because <laughs> uh, usually all these uh, military uh, uh, traveling are quite mundane. Yeah, see, there's Mr. H walking along the street. That's, it's more like that, one foot behind the other. But as you can see, it wasn't quite as uphill for me as it was for the Carthaginians. Carthaginians got us a really big advantage. Their leader is Hannibal Barca. Hannibal Barca was a kid at the end of the First Punic War. Now he's all grown up for round number two, and he's in the family business. And that family business is hating Rome, and believe me, he hates Rome. Allegedly, his father held Hannibal's hand over an altar, used a knife to cut, uh, you know, slash across his hand to make a blood oath to destroy Rome. For all I know, Hannibal might have come up with this idea himself because he really, really hated Rome. Now, a lot of times people wonder what, what they look like, uh, what various historical figures look like. When it comes to someone who's Roman or Carthaginian, you know, they're pretty good. They don't usually do idealized uh, sculptures. You know, the, the Romans are kind of, you know, what you see is what you get, warts and all, the whole thing. So I'm pretty sure that's what Hannibal looked like. Just kind of an idealized version, you know, it looks Carthaginian, you know, some kind of North African ancestry of some kind. There are the elephants again. You see the one falling off the uh, cliff over there? <laughs> yep, it happened. He took, um, I think he took 37 elephants up there, and not all of them made it. In fact, you know, they did find some of the skulls and tusks up in the, uh, up in the Alps. So you know this actually existed. They didn't make this up. That's what I think Hannibal looked like. There's a movie called Hannibal, Terror of Rome. Uh, I forgot this guy's name, Philip something or other. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. He's wearing a, a eye patch because 
he caught a, a rock or an arrow in the eye and got infected, you know, so there you are. I got to put a patch over it. But I think that's a very good depiction of what Hannibal looked like. Everyone wants to know what Hannibal looked like. Well, there's your answer. Let's talk about these elephants, man. Look at this. Head on view. Why did they bring the elephants? That's a staple of North African and Middle Eastern warfare. And it's, it's like a tank. It's coming straight at you, man. I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, you got your little short sword. You got your spears. But elephant skin is very tough. I mean, you can stab at it, and it probably won't even notice unless, you know, you take a direct shot at it or something. It's very hard to do when you're in panic, running away, turning and throwing the spear. And they've got people up on the on top here. I mean, uh, uh, India, it's called a hoodoo. I'm not sure what the Carthaginian word is for that but people up there with arrows or spears you know they can throw it down at you you have to throw it up at them it's not always so easy this look familiar there lord of the ring fans yeah that's where that's where uh, tolkien got the idea uh these are what they called opulifonts they didn't really exist but they do have a disturbing resemblance to polexodon which is a, a four tusk elephant living on the back end of the ice age it was in china i'm wondering if the chinese might have saw the last one of them or so well uh, Hannibal knew his Roman uh, enemies very well. They had no idea he was coming over the Alps. They tried to get him in Spain, and he was gone. He came up and over the Alps and scares the living bejesus out of the Romans. Big battles of Lake Trasimir and, of course, Cani, where, you know, he, the middle drops back and he crushes them down from the flanks, and 70,000 Romans get killed. But he can't take Rome because he couldn't bring siege equipment with him over the, uh, over the Alps. And there he is in front of Rome, and he can't get in. In fact, there was a Romans, uh, Roman nobleman having an auction on the wall or on the land, about the land he was sitting on while he could see it, you know. <laughs> hey, man, how about some respect here, you know. <laughs> so he has to try and uh, get the rest of Italy to rise up against the Romans. Some of them do, some cities do, some don't. He spent 17 years walking up and down Italy, just destroying things left and right. Romans can't stop him. They can slow him down. They can hurt him, but they can't stop him. And the whole time this is happening, Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus, he gets that name later, he's studying uh, Hannibal, even fought against him a couple times, taking some notes right here. And he's going to figure out how to defeat Hannibal. First, he goes to Spain to cut off his supplies, and then he's going to go straight down to North Africa itself. There's a sculpture of what, some, what they think he might look like. I'm not sure where this cartoon came from. I don't know if he had blonde hair, but the expression looks about right. Always that grim look on his face. Of course, someone's destroying a country 17 years. You don't have a lot to smile about. Let's go with that, huh? You like that idea? He's even got the Carthaginian standard down at his feet. So... He goes down to North Africa right in front of Carthage, except, you know, unlike the, unlike the Carthaginians, the Romans bring their siege equipment. You see, they're good with siege warfare. And Hannibal, Scipio, they go toe-to-toe -to -toe at Zama in 2002. The elephants, they cause a few problems, but, you know, he's figured out. They line up, they open these channels up in the ranks that are really good in drills and let the elephants run through, stab at them, bring them down, maybe panic them to have them turn around, trample through the Carthaginians. It happens a few times. Hannibal wins every single battle he fights against the Romans, except for the one at the end, the Battle of Zama. He is completely undefeated, loses one battle at the end, and loses the war. Kind of like the 2007 New England Patriots. They won every single game, got to the Super Bowl, and lost to the New York Giants. Yes, a fun time was had by all the non-New England fans. I was very happy to see that. I actually watched that game in Canada, believe it or not. So, do you think it's over yet? Oh, not even close. Hannibal makes a run for it. He eventually goes to the east. Uh, he's going to commit suicide. Um, and there's Carthage. Look, they've taken everything from Carthage. Everything used to belong to Carthage belongs to, uh, to Rome now. They took the Spanish possessions, already conquered Greece. That's something else altogether. Uh, all of North Africa there is tributary to Rome, so that little gray thing, that's all Carthage has. Carthage has nothing. They're allowed 12 ships, that little chunk of land, and that's it. So you think it's over for Carthage? Oh, not even close, man. Carthage starts to revive again. First time it was a naval power. Then it was a land power. Now it's becoming a commercial power. What is it with Carthage, man? You can't kill this thing. Right, and now the Romans are getting nervous because you know the Carthaginians came right to the front gate one time before. How do you know it doesn't happen again? Got Cato, the elder, uh, the elder over here, screaming, Carth uh, "Carthago, Estelenda! Carthage must be destroyed!" 
And, um, you know, Carthage isn't really a threat, but you never know with these guys. You always think they're gone and they come back again. So they don't even look for a pretext to start the war. They're just going to attack Carthage right now. They put Carthage under siege. Again, good at siege warfare to Romans. But Carthage has been waiting for this thing for a while. And three horrifying years siege. Look at that. 149 to 146 BC. And they also burned down Carthage. Uh, Corinth to 146 in Greece, so bad, bad uh, year to be an insurance guy. But they finally destroy Carthage. They get over the wall, and the first guy over the wall, look, there, there it is. Look, just, they, just, they get through, and they're just butchering people left and right, not taking any prisoners. First guy over the wall is Tiberius Gracchus. Going to hear about him when he tries to save the Republic. But they're going to finally destroy Carthage. They overrun the city. They're butchering people. Whoever is left gets sold off into slavery. They destroy the entire city. They level it. They say not one brick on top of another. Said they sow salt in the soil to make sure nothing ever grows there again. Yeah, this isn't just conquest. This isn't just destruction. This is like an extinction level event right here. You know, they are making sure that Carthage isn't there. But, you know, Carthage finds a way talk about that in another show or two down the road so like we said they fight to the death it's not just conquest it's delibellium which means absolute destruction there's no treaty or anything there's nobody to negotiate with you've killed everybody like i said before extinction level event while i was out on vacation i had a nice little discussion with a, with a, a friend of mine who um still a friend even after discussion <laughs> uh tried to tell me there were four extinction level events in uh, earth's history not five and I disagreed, and uh, I stuck him with the bill for pizza, too. Because when we talk about extinction-level events, yeah, Roman Carthage come to mind. But let's talk about stuff that's almost destroyed the planet here. The Ordovician Cerulean mass extinction event 440 million years ago. 85% of life on this planet was destroyed. See Jackalopteus right there? That looks like a sea scorpion over here. I've got something there. I'm not sure what that is. Lots of great seafood back then. Most life is in the water, a little bit on the land, but something, some kind of an event, mass extinction led to the destruction of 85% of life on this planet. There's a lot of discussion over it might be. Well, he's got the favorite asteroid impact or maybe volcanism. But the consensus is that was an ice age. Yes, it was an ice age. The glaciers overtook the land. Right, and they cool down the earth because a glacier is ice, it's white, reflects light, you know, away from the planet from the sun. And the entire planet cooled off, and it led to the seas cooling and led to the destruction, like I said, of 85% of life. Well, that is depressing, isn't it? <laughs> and you know, like I said to my class a lot of times. If you want to know the answer, look at the map. The map tells you a lot. And the reason why I'm I'm on board with the glacier theory is, you know, look, it's one major continent and a few smaller ones. So the one down the bottom there, Gondwana, if that's covered by ice and it's down near the South Pole, yeah, it, it's that's a large chunk of ice. There's no other land, really. So, yes, it can cool off the entire planet. I think it is completely plausible. But life finds a way, just like uh, Dr. Uh, Ian Malcolm said in Jurassic Park. Life finds a way. How did the Earth get away from the grip of the glaciers? A little bit of volcanism. You melt the edge of the glacier, the glacier starts to retreat, and finally the sunlight manages not to bounce off, and life finds a way into the Devonian period. And then we come to the mass extinction in the Devonian period, 365 million years ago. 80% of life dies then. There's one of my favorite fish right there, Dunkleosteus. It's the size of a school bus, armored head. My friend Nicole Lindsay was talking about a, a theory where they said it was actually smaller. So how's it hold that head up is what I want to know. It called it shrunk to dunk. But anyway, we'll find out some more. It's all still, you know, a new theory and very speculative. But the Devonian mass extinction 365 million years ago, what could have possibly led to that one? I bet you didn't see this coming. And of course, we got the asteroid theory. Can't find an asteroid. Could it be volcanism? Always a good choice, but not really finding any evidence of it. Attack of the killer plants. Yeah, we think the we think the trees and the plants here might have made their bid for world domination 365 million years ago. There's not much life on land, a few insects, mostly plants. 
the problem with plants, yes, they take in carbon dioxide. What's carbon dioxide? A lot of oxygen. So they're taking oxygen out of the, uh, out of the atmosphere, which means there's not a lot of uh, oxygen in the water. And a lot of marine life is dying. And the root system, it's a very thick root system. And if there are that many plants, if there are more plants then than there is now, you know they must have uh, been hoarding nutrients that weren't making it into the sea. So it led to a, a oxidation event, a lack of oxygen in the oceans. But since you know they they uh, they bring in carbon dioxide and out comes the oxygen, you know the reign of the plants isn't very long because eventually enough oxygen is going to come from the plants to eventually let life find a way once again. <laughs> But uh, you know what? I'm going to be real nice to the plants. I'm going to water them, give them nice nutrients, right? I'm going to hedge my bet just in case they try this again. But you're never going to look at the garden center the same way again, are you? I didn't think so. I call this Dev World, Devonian World. Again, the map tells you what you need to see. See that big continent down on the bottom? If the plants dominate that, they've got most of the planet. You already know they live all over the place because it's green. But they once they get the big one, the small ones will follow. Then comes the worst mass extinction of them all, the Permian. They call this the Great Dying. Yeah, that's how bad. 95% of everything on this planet died. In fact, it almost ended the planet. I put Dimetrodon in there. He wasn't around for a Permian mass extinction. They'd already come and gone long before. People always want to know if Dimetrodon was around. It's also my favorite Permian animal. The guy over here on the left is the Gorgonopsid, the most ferocious predator the world had ever seen up to this point I think it could fight a t-rex it could fight a t-rex i think t-rex will win but it's gonna always been in a fight well the permian mass extinction we got a pretty good idea what caused that All right definitely volcanism <laughs> no doubt about it the siberian traps and they're still there today a volcanic region in siberia for whatever reason they started blowing up. Again, we got the asteroid theory, but we can't find an asteroid crater. They found a couple here, there, but not old enough, or maybe not even an asteroid. But we do know that these volcanoes erupted in mass, and we're talking thousands of volcanoes here. All of the smoke and soot and everything in the air, we're talking, you know, the old nuclear winter here, it blots out the sun, the plants die, the plant eaters die, there goes the meat eaters. And, you know, even the stuff in the sea begins to die as well because lava and toxic materials going into the ocean, right? There's no escape, man. The ocean, 95% of everything in the ocean is going to die. Land, they're not doing too great either. I think it was 93% of everything on the land dies. So, you know, a little bit better if you want to call it that. But not only was it a mass extinction, it almost ended life on this planet. I mean, that could have easily been the end and we could have just had this third rock from the sun be an actual rock that is devoid of any interest to anybody. Here's Earth in the Permian period. You can tell that, you know, it's almost one continent here, Pangaea. Again, the map tells you what you need to know because in this era, the middle of the landmass there is basically uninhabitable. I mean, it, it, you think the Gobi Desert's bad? Try it times 100. So everybody's kind of living on the coast close you get to the glacier you maybe can go coast to coast over there but most things are living on the coastline so if the deck and traps are exploding and they're almost in the center of the continent there's no escape i mean the soot is going to go to the north it's going to go to the south if you're in the middle of the continent you're close to it so you got to run from it and there's nowhere to run because it will cover the entire planet 95 percent of life dies but hey life finds a way right Here's some more evidence that we know what happens. Look at this mass death here. This is a fossil bed, almost solid, from, uh, of uh, various sea creatures here. A lot of trilobites and stuff like that in there. Uh, it's just a solid wall of fossils. They found this in Ohio. Ohio is a hotbed for all kinds of stuff like that over there because, you know, it used to be the shield under there. Western PA, we got some of that too, but, you know, mountains and stuff. So all kinds of other stuff landed on top of it. You go towards the western part of Ohio, start to flatten out, you start to find stuff like this too. Now here's the one that I had a debate with my friend over here. The Triassic-Jurassic extinction. 210 million years ago, estimated 75% of life dies. Some people have the unmitigated gall to suggest this never happened. How dare you, sir?
<laughs> now, this is the one we know the least about because, admittedly, we don't have a lot of evidence. You don't find a lot of fossils in the uh, on the Triassic-Jurassic uh, line over here. Ironically, again, we got the meteor theory again. Maybe that's what caused it, and a lot of volcanism. So we're not really sure what had happened. We do know there, that there seem to be a lot less fossils at the end of the Triassic and a lot of fossils at the beginning of the Jurassic. So something must have happened. There's also some uh, other um, exotic theories like, uh, what was that they said again? Uh, uh, the supernova exploded and coated the whole planet in radiation and... Uh, uh, gamma rays and things like this, which I, you know, I guess it could happen, but we've got to find some evidence about it. But the really ironic thing, that if it was an asteroid strike, and we're still looking for the asteroid, right? They think they found one in Australia, but they're not sure yet, is that um, the dinosaurs get to start in the Jurassic, and then the asteroids are going to take them out in the Cretaceous. So the asteroid got them started, if this is true, and asteroids was going to end it for them. Dinosaurs were around in the Triassic, but they were very small. After Jurassic, they get bigger, and that's where they start to really dominate the planet. And if it was an asteroid strike, based on what we know about KT, we talked about last time, smaller animals survive this thing, so dinosaurs are small. Jurassic start getting bigger till you know, the big one hits the KT extinction. And there it is, KT extinction, 65 million years ago, 80% of life, dinosaurs, non-avian dinosaurs, even a few mammals got it. Sea life took a hit too, but you know the fish, the sharks, and alligators made it through. We we know all about KT. We talked about that last time. <laughs> we do know this happened. We've got plenty of evidence. Nobody debates that this happened. Some people love their volcanoes, say it has something to do with it too. Maybe the asteroid caused the volcanoes to erupt and made it even worse. But you know, it did happen, and it was very sad. Unless you're a mammal, it worked out for the mammals. A small mammal, I should say. Now, we talked about Rome and Carthage, how they fought to the death, right? Extinction of Carthage. We talked about extinction events. I was thinking, Rome and Carthage fought each other three times. Three very, very vicious fights, right? And, um, and the mass extinction, I got a present here for you. Nice little chart I found. You could, That's for you in case you do a report on this stuff. Don't tell them I gave it to you. But I was talking about Rome and Carthage fighting it out. Well, Steelers and Ravens, they fought each other in 2008 three times. Three very vicious, wild, nasty games they fought against each other. And uh, at the end, Pittsburgh ended uh, uh, Baltimore's season, went on to win the Super Bowl, just like the Romans. They ended Carthage, went to become the greatest empire in uh, ancient history. Now, I remember this game, Pittsburgh 23, Ravens 20. It was on September 29th, 2008. I remember that goes two days after my wedding. <laughs> yep, they put on a game just for me. I remember two things about this game. One, the horrible throwback uniforms they're wearing. It's from the 1960 season. And I don't know what's up with the gold helmet there. You don't have to go that far with it. It looks terrible. And the second thing I remember about this game is they kept trying to tackle high. You don't try and wrap your arms around his chest or go for his head, okay? You're not going to tackle him. Now, you may get a shot on them, but you're not going to bring them down. you got to go for the hips or go for the legs. That's how you bring them down. If you don't get both legs, you get one, you slow them down. And my cousins was telling me, oh, it's a great game, isn't it? Just for you, a really entertaining game. I said, I don't want an entertaining game. I want the Steelers to jump out to a 35 nothing lead and hold on. <laughs> but, hey, we get the win, and that's all that matters. They're in the same division, so you know there's a rematch coming up. Just like Roman Carthage, we got another rematch in Pittsburgh and Baltimore. This one's down in Baltimore, or as they like to say, Baltimore. I say Balto. But the disease-ridden filth called the Baltimore Ravens are the home team this time around. And this is a rough game, too. You can tell by the score. Steelers win it 13-9. And what makes this game so memorable right there, Steeler receiver Santonio Holmes is catching the ball. He's got his feet in the end zone. But we're not sure if the ball is over the goal line or not. Oh, there's a bit of a problem. Of course, the Ravens say it wasn't. The Steelers said it was. They stopped the game for 15 minutes, looked at the film from 47 different directions, and finally concluded that it was indeed a touchdown. The Ravens are screaming they got ripped off. I don't know. <laughs> All I know is they looked at it 57 different ways, man, you know? So, uh, 157 different ways. So, you know, all, all I can tell you is I got to go with what the ref said. So, we got the win there, right? So, just like the Punic Wars, we've gone into a second one. <laughs>
they say, we'll see you again. Oh, and they will, too, because we meet them again in the playoffs. Yeah, this one is the AFC Championship. It's actually in January 2009, but 2008 season. Pittsburgh and Baltimore, once again to Pittsburgh, going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. The winner goes to the Super Bowl. We were hoping for all PA Super Bowl. Philly playing Arizona on the other side, but Arizona won. Pittsburgh goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Baltimore. This is a really rough game. This is classic under the lights, really cold, you know, everything you want in a game. Steeler victory that helped out, too. I could have gone to this game, but tickets, were you ready for this? $400 for the nosebleed section. Can you believe this? Yeah, and that means I got to bring Mrs. H with me. That's another 400 bucks. You know, she doesn't like this game, and it's going to be really cold. She's not going to like it. Of course, my cousin wants to come along. There's, you know, we're looking $1,200 right here, man. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll watch it from home. All right, we got the win. That's all that matters. But the strange thing about this game, we take down the Ravens for the third time. We end their season, just like the Romans defeated Cards for a third time and ended their existence. This game... I thought was actually bigger than the Super Bowl. It's a really strange thing to say because you've beaten your arch rival and you know, and you feel like you're on top of the mountain, but you got one more to climb, the Super Bowl. So I was worried they were going to have an emotional letdown against the Arizona Cardinals in the Super Bowl. Well, it didn't. We won, 27-23. But Arizona really played a, rough, a tough game. I mean, they fought with everything they had, all respect to the Arizona Cardinals. Here's the winning touchdown. This look familiar? Yep, San Antonio Holmes got both feet in bounds again. Here we go. Now, the difference is that this is not in the field of play. This is towards the back of the end zone. So where the ball is doesn't matter. What matters is where his feet are. So he's got both feet in bounds. He's got control of the ball. You can catch it out there. It doesn't matter as long as your feet are in bounds. So, hey, we got our sixth Super Bowl on top of the world. Greatest team of all time. But I keep thinking about that, too. It's just so strange how the conference championship just seemed bigger than the Super Bowl. It was, you know, Ben Roethlisberger is happy about it. And that was great. 2008 season was fantastic. Last I won a Super Bowl. But you know what? That was then. This is now. We're in 2023 now. And the Steelers already played their first preseason game against Tampa Bay. Knows in the same stadium they won their last Super Bowl in. And it's, it's just time to move on. It was a great era, 2008. Thanks for the memories, Big Ben. But we got a new guy now. Here we are, Kenny Pickett. And don't live in the past. It's a weird thing for a historian to say. Go forward. Because you talk about people in the past, go forward, make your own story, and one day they talk about you. And hopefully it's not about you like trying to, you know, uh, shoplift chocolate milk and caught or something. <laughs> make sure they say something good. So you and me, we got lots of chapters to write. I look forward to talking to you about it later on. I will see you next week. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And uh, see you next week. Das Vidanya.